Hello, I'm Jim Rogers, and this broadcast is where construction industry professionals go to learn about the latest products, innovations, and methods used to improve our industry. Today, I'm joined by longtime industry expert and concrete advocate, Michael Weber, and we're going to talk about the most widely used building material on the planet. Stick with me, and welcome to Thoughts from the Field. Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, it's been a while since I have been on the video live streams here on LinkedIn Learning, so glad to be back. Um, thank you to those that have been joining me on the audio events feature on, uh, on LinkedIn. I will still continue doing those. I've been using those for my live office hours where you can join me on audio and unmute and ask a question, start a conversation. Those have been very successful, so I will keep doing those at the same time, Wednesday every week. Um, so I'll be back here tomorrow for that as well. Um, today, uh, we're gonna be joined by special guest, Mike Weber. Um, and before I bring Mike on, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, background into what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and, and I wanted to start by talking about World of Concrete. So it seems like with the start of 2022, live in-person events are back. And so I'm, I'm really excited for that because I don't know about you, but I'm kind of tired of the virtual events. I love that we can, we can join and, and you know, have Zoom meetings together and not have to travel across the country for a, you know, for a 40 minute meeting. That's great. But I'm really happy that we have live in-person events back kind of kicked off at the beginning of this year with World of Concrete, which uh, I was at. And hopefully you've seen some of the videos that I've posted from World of Concrete. Um, we have Autodesk University, another one of my favorite events that is coming up later this year and calls for proposals for speaker proposals are out for that. So go check out Autodesk University if you're interested in doing that. And then of course, we also have right now today, happening today is the American Concrete Institute's convention, which is finally back in person. And uh, that is the place to be if you're a concrete person uh, participating in their uh, on their committees, or listening to their lectures. And the reason I bring up the ACI convention is that is where our uh, our guest is joining us from today. So I'm gonna bring him up here. Uh, Mike, welcome. Good afternoon. And uh, yes, I'm in my hotel room right now. <laughs> and so uh, uh, it's been uh, lots of meetings. I got here on Sunday and we'll be heading out tomorrow morning, so. Nice. Is how how is the uh, how is the event? Is it? I, I mean, this is the first time in person for what three years now? Yeah, for uh, well over two years, and um, I, you know, you can only get so much committee work done virtually. It's just not the same. You don't have the sidebar conversations that that um, a lot of things get accomplished. Um, that, and this isn't my first show this year. Um, you mentioned the World of Concrete uh, a couple weeks after that was the um, uh, National Association of Home Builders International yes. Builder Show. Yes. And yeah. uh, that was what they called Design and Construction Week because they were in conjunction with the Kitchen and Bath Show. So uh, those two shows were in Orlando at the Orlando uh, Orange County Convention Center. And they had approximately 75,000 attendees. 45,000 yeah, of those were specifically for the Builder Show. Um, yeah, that's that's awesome. That's, it that's is, awesome. and uh, it's exciting. Next year, um, uh, twenty three, we'll be in Las Vegas. And well, and, and and Mike, I I I, I was going to let you go ahead and introduce yourself because you've got you know. So I, I think I said in some of the promos and my posts, um, you know, Mike is a longtime colleague, longtime friend. Um, I I call Mike like an industry expert and and real industry advocate. So you you've, I know one of the things that you've done for many years is participated with the National Association of Home Builders mm -hmm. and were really instrumental in uh, doing something that ended up affecting me personally, which was starting the Concrete Home Council um, that, uh, 
that that my wife ended up going and running for a while, right? Um, but you've and, you and just it was done... a loss when she left that <laughs> position for another yeah. one, I might yeah. say. <laughs> but you've done um, you you've just done a lot of things in industry. Where what do you where are you now? What are you doing now? I'm national business development manager for the Euclid Chemical Company, and I like to describe us as all things concrete. You know, we have. Um, uh, admixtures for uh, concrete and block producers, manufacturers. We have um, uh, construction products for contractors uh, to use. We have repair materials. Uh, we are a U.S. owned company uh, that, that services the Americas as well as other entities around the world. Uh, it, it's, it, it's pretty exciting. So you know, my role is more as an industry consultant. I'm not commission based. I'm not in sales, but uh, I'm here to ensure projects go well. And uh, a lot of what I do is specification reviews and uh, uh, product recommendations, representation. Uh, for example, here at the American Concrete Institute's uh, uh, committee meetings where standards are being written. Uh, guides are being developed in in order to better the industry. I'm on four different standard committees here. I'm on uh, uh, precast structures, on precast panels. Uh, I'm a subcommittee chair for uh, 332, which is residential. We're developing a, uh, a chapter uh, that will be included in the residential standard, 332 residential concrete standard. And I'm also on the insulated concrete forms 560 committee. So that keeps me busy. But a lot of this is just getting to see people that I um, I network with and yeah. can keep on top of things with. Well, I, you, you kind of, I'm going to say you deserve a medal for staying involved in these committees continuously like you have. I was I was involved, I was there with you on some of the ACI committee meetings for what seemed like many years to me. And and uh, I, I kind of had to take a break for that. Haven't, haven't been involved for a little while now. Um, there's a lot of work that gets done at those committees. There's a lot of, um, I mean, this is where the codes are developed, right? For, I mean, for, for concrete anyway, the ACI conventions and the committees are where our codes get developed, right? And many of these are used worldwide. So this is a worldwide yeah. audience that is here. And of course, I'm just a glutton for punishment. You know, that's <laughs> that's what it all boils down to. I've been yeah. in this industry all my life. Uh, I started in my family's ready mix sand and gravel uh, business and ended up relocating to Southwest Michigan, where I was part of the growth of the largest ready mix and block producer in the state and ended up um, at the Portland Cement Association. That's what really brought me to the national level. And I was yeah. there for uh, seven and a half years and, and um, still have a lot of friends there. But, you, you know, that's where I really uh, started having um, influence and participation at the national level. Within the National Association of Home Builders, I'm a trustee with the Leading Suppliers Council, which is where okay. the large manufacturers uh, join NHB at the national level um, outside of at the local level. And I'm also a trustee with the building systems councils, which is, uh, you know, where the concrete home building council is located as well as panelized modular and log building systems. That was what Dawn headed up when she yeah. was working for NHB. So. <laughs> yeah. And she is, and she, she is still in the industry, as you know, on the, mm -hmm. on the masonry side of things. So still in the, uh, in the cement mace based building products uh, side of, of the industry. I, I want to back up for just a minute. And for those that are joining us that are not concrete experts um, and, and talk about, I, I want to lead into what makes concrete sustainable. Um, what, has you know what about concrete has the biggest environmental footprint um and and talk a little bit about you know what what you do and what euclid does so this was just a, a little graphic that i grabbed from the portland cement association um that that talk about you know what what is concrete made of and you and i have dealt with for a lot of years people using the term concrete and cement 
interchangeably. And of course, you know, you, you and I will, will bristle and say, no, that's, they're not the same thing. And, and my nine-year-old now can point out the difference between a concrete truck and, uh, you know, and a cement uh, train or a cement truck, you know, driving down the road with the dry powder. But, you know, this is what concrete is on the screen here, right? It's, it's sand, rock, you know, most of it is aggregate. 60 to 75% is aggregate. We have some water and then we have cement. So somewhere around 10%, right? Seven to 15% is what the graphic says. Um, what's not on this graphic though, and I think we'll talk about it a little, you know, in, in just a few minutes, is uh, is what you do, right? The, the chemical admixtures. Sure. And to me, from my standpoint, that's kind of a, a big deal because on a commercial construction project or even a residential construction project, I mean, anything that, that a homeowner is not doing, I don't see very much concrete made like, like this, right? It, it, it all has some sort of admixtures from, from my viewpoint anyway, right? We, we have, we have chemicals that reduce the amount of water that we need to put in it because we don't need that much water in concrete. We just put more in it to make it workable. So we can stop putting more water in it and put a little bit of chemical admixture in for that. Um, we have admixtures that can affect the set times so that we can make concrete and truck it, you know, a long distance to somewhere where there is no concrete plant. Um, what, what else, what, what else do we do with chemical admixtures these days? It, it's, it's um, a big long list. For example, uh, concrete, if it's going to be exposed to freezing and thawing, freeze thaw cycles, it needs to have air entrainment, which is in a liquid that goes into the mix that provides a, uh, an air void system in the hardened concrete so that it can take on moisture, freeze, and it kind of acts as pressure relief valves so that it doesn't damage your concrete. Um, of course, you always want to have a sealer on concrete if it's exposed to freeze-thaw cycles to help keep from having that water entering the concrete, um, you know, during uh, winter weather. Uh, sure. We've got, um, uh, you know, a well-designed mix is probably the most important thing. The uh, uh, and that's based upon the aggregates that are being used. You've got a fine aggregate and a coarse aggregate. Coarse aggregate, of course, would be stone. Uh, and then fine aggregate would be sand. So it, you want the uh, appropriate ratio, not only for strength, but to minimize shrinkage, which comes back to the uh, being able to reduce the amount of water in a mix. It doesn't take much to hydrate the concrete to right. start the process to make it hard. So anytime you can reduce the amount of water that is required to make it workable so that the, the contractors can place it, um, that's where your water reducers come in. Uh, if you need to, let's say you're uh, placing the concrete into a form that has a lot of steel reinforcement in it and it needs to be very flowable then you would use a high range water reducer, commonly referred to as a super plasticizer. Gives it the added flowability without the added water. So it doesn't affect the shrinkage. There are other uh, instances where uh, you might have a shrinkage compensating additive, which is important okay. during the first 24 hours of your concrete's uh, drying time. And then there's a shrinkage reducing admixture that would actually, uh, you know, work the remaining, let's say, 27 days of cure. Okay. Uh, concrete strengths are typically measured at seven days, where you should be about two thirds of your full strength under, uh, you know, lab type curing uh, environments or well cured concrete, and 28 days for full strength. Now, when you start adding other cementitious materials, then that uh, strength curve might need to be extended to 56 days. Yeah. Well, and that, that was the one thing we were going to talk about as well today is the uh, yeah. other cementitious materials. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to stop you there and, and just talk about that strength for just a minute. So, you know, everything that you just talked about in terms of um, some of the chemical admixtures, um, most of it anyway, really leads back to 
making sure the concrete is as durable as possible. So I think you know concrete's big strength is its strength. That didn't that didn't sound right. But but you know one of concrete's big advantages is its strength. And the more durable that we make concrete the longer it lasts. And so to me, one of the things when I'm talking about concrete sustainability um, that I think a lot of, not a lot of people, but some people in the industry tend to overlook is the fact that um, it's really durable. It lasts a long time. We've got concrete pavements out there, freeways, heavily trafficked freeways that are 50 plus years old. We've got concrete bridges that are older than that. Um, so to me, one of the things that makes concrete sustainable is the fact that it's durable and it lasts a long time. We don't have to build something twice or three times because it lasts so long. And I think that the chemicals and the things that we've learned to do in creating mixed designs and, and looking at it from a chemistry standpoint, um, it, it, you know, or, or have really affected some of the sustainable properties and improve the durability of concrete over the years. Um, but one of the things that people do talk about uh, is is the carbon footprint of, of concrete. And really they're, they're when that comes up, I think we're really looking at the carbon footprint of cement. So again, concrete as a product, some more things that I think make it sustainable is it's generally always locally produced, right? So we get we get local sand, local rock. Um, we do have to truck in the cement. There's a little bit of transportation that happens with cement. Um, but again, that's maybe 10% of concrete. Um, you know, so so producing the ingredients for concrete locally, I think helps make it sustainable. But when we get to that cement, um, for those that are not familiar, I think I've got a video or two in my, my concrete course on LinkedIn Learning where we talk about how cement is made and um, you know the, the, the big process in terms of making cement is we, we, we mine limestone, right? And we crush the limestone and eventually we, we put it into a kiln and we heat it to what, Mike, 2,000 degrees, about 2,000 degrees? About 2,500, yep. 2,500 degrees. So that heating um, obviously takes, takes a lot of energy um, and it is what releases the CO2, is, is the heating of that material. The um, limestone. Yeah, to, the limestone. Yeah, the limestone that we use to, to make the cement. Now, over the years, um, the industry has, has also done some things in terms of the heating, right, with with feeding heat back into uh, the kiln and kind mm -hmm. of recycling some of the heat that's helped reduce the the carbon footprint. Um, I the the thing that I've seen in some of the plants around here are the burning of tires instead of natural gas, which is mm -hmm. is kind of interesting because I, I you know I'm not sure that that changes the carbon footprint at all, but it certainly can't be overlooked because one we're not using a natural resource and two. We're, we are burning tires, which are this huge problem in uh, in the U.S., I think in the world, really. Like, how do you get rid of tires? You know, they never degrade. They never go away. Well, one of the ways we get rid of tires now is we use those as fuel in the cement process. But but we still, you know, we're heating that, that limestone to 2,500 degrees. Um, that heat releases a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, and that's where, where people kind of zero in on, um, you know, that's where the, the big carbon footprint is for cement and then the concrete that's made from it. Um, and, and so what, what I really started talking to you about a, a couple months ago um, is this almost seemingly to me like simple step that is all of a sudden being taken in the industry um, to reduce that carbon footprint of cement itself by like what 10 percent almost immediately yes. um by creating something called portland limestone cement so so the the cement that we typically use around the world is portland cement um and and that conforms to ASTM C one fifty. Am I still remembering my, that, my that, yeah. all right? Yeah. All right. That, that conforms to ASTM C one fifty. Um and 
and, and that's Portland cement. Now we have a product called Portland limestone cement, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give it back to you to talk about Portland limestone cement, Mike, because I know you've been talking about this to a lot of people. Well, there's there's uh, you know the standard for the um, yeah, everybody knows Portland cement, uh, and that was the ASTM C150 standard. It's in. Um, all of the specifications that I work with, with engineers, architects, uh, uh, design build contractors and such. What's happened is in order for um, the cement manufacturers to meet their goals of being net zero by 2050, I believe it is, they're, they're looking to try and minimize the amount of limestone that is actually run through the cement kiln because that, that heat is releasing the, um, uh, the CO2 from the limestone that's mm -hmm. being run through the kiln. So there is, and, and this has been around for a long time, an ASTM standard for blended hydraulic cement. It's called uh, ASTM C595, blended hydraulic cement. One of those cements is a type 1L, it looks like IL, but it's type 1L cement, and that's Portland limestone cement. There are other uh, blended cements, hydraulic cements that, that meet that same designation of ASTM C595. It would be uh, 1S, which would be a blended Portland and slag cement, a, um, a type 1P, which is a blended fly ash and Portland cement. Now for the slag and the uh, and the poslin, uh, the fly ash, let's say, um, those are typically added by the ready mix producer separate. So they've always referenced the ASTM C150 for Portland cement, and then they've added either slag or fly ash, or maybe even both in their mixes, um, meeting the, the specifications. What's happened now is the cement manufacturers are converting their manufacturing operation to reduce the amount of uh, Portland cement that is running through the kiln so that it will now all meet ASTM C595 type 1L cement. What they're doing is after the clinker comes out of the kiln, that's what you get after you heat everything up and run it through the, the mill, um, they will intergrind uh, limestone with that clinker, and they are in essence adding 10% to up the the 595 standard allows up to 15% limestone added to that Portland cement. So that C595 can have up to 15% limestone added that didn't go through the kiln. So in essence, you immediately reduce the carbon footprint of the cement now by 15%. That, that's huge. Now yeah. you, can, uh, you can also take that and still add fly ash or slag cement. And slag cement, let's say you add it at a 50% uh, replacement for the Portland limestone cement, the type 1L. So in essence, if, if you've uh, lowered your carbon footprint for your cement by 15% and you've added 50% slag cement, which is a direct replacement pound for pound for the Portland, then you've just uh, lowered your carbon footprint on your concrete by 65%. This is huge. Yeah, yeah that, that is. That's amazing. So I'm going to... I'm going to back up and see. Okay, so, so we, we we're talking about cement. So just the one ingredient in concrete. And um, I, I I pulled up a, a picture of of clinker here. I assume this is clinker um, that 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 Mike's talked about that is produced as part of the cement manufacturing process. So basically, we mine limestone, we crush limestone, we heat it to 2,500 degrees it comes out molten and eventually cools into what you see on the screen here is clinker. And then this clinker is ground down into the fine cement powder. So Mike, what you're saying is that the Portland's Portland limestone cement is produced by taking 
what, about 10 to 15 percent of this clinker away and Correct. just putting back limestone and then grinding that product all together into the fine powder that still just looks like cement. So in my in my concrete, if uh, if I can if I can throw this slide back up here in my concrete, I'm still going to use the same amount of Portland limestone cement as Portland cement. But that Portland limestone cement is now is blended with some limestone. So I've reduced the carbon footprint of just that one little ingredient by like 15 percent. Right. Correct. Typically anywhere from, uh, you know, 10 to 15 percent. Every manufacturer is going to do it just a little differently. Yeah. Um, but but the one thing is when we're talking about this seven to 15 percent that you show here, uh, it, it's best to refer to it as cementitious material because yeah. it, it, it most of your mixes today are not just a straight Portland cement or Portland limestone cement mix. They will typically have uh, fly ash in them where fly ash is available, maybe up to 15 to 25 percent or in uh, some areas, uh, slag cement is more predominant. And mm -hmm. slag cement, they will run that from anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. Um, well, let's yeah. So let's let's talk about that for a minute. So so instead of seven to 15 percent cement, like you see in the graphic here, we've already been taking a portion of that. Uh, what, like 20 percent, 30 percent of that cement and replacing it with what Mike's referring to as cementitious products. So when, when he says fly ash, fly ash is basically what is the byproduct from coal power plants that Correct. would, again, normally we'd have to find a place to put it, uh, you know, bury it. Um, it's a waste product. The industry for many years has already been taking some of the cement out of our concrete and replacing it with that fly ash that has some cementitious properties. It acts like cement um, when it's combined with cement. And, and we've already been lowering the carbon footprint of concrete by doing that. And then the other product that, that you mentioned, uh, Mike, was slag cement. So in, in my area, we seem to have uh, plenty of fly ash, but in some parts of the, the country or some parts of the world, um, there, there's not availability of the right kind of fly ash. And so they might use a slag cement and slag is a byproduct of uh, steel mills. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so again, we're taking, uh, to me, that's, that's kind of substantial. And I, and I don't know that that story gets told enough. Um, it's, it's not just that we're cutting the carbon footprint of concrete uh, by using this other product instead of using cement. It's that we're using another product that would normally be waste that we'd have to find a, a landfill for it to go into. Right. Um, and, and some people, you know, are talking about, well, the coal fired power plants are going away. So the fly ash. Well, that has limited some sure. of the fly ash availability. However, sure. there has been an overabundance of fly ash for decades that the uh, uh, the uh, it's gone into the waste stream and the large landfill operators were basically storing it. I heard that. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, now what they're doing, the term is called harvesting. They're, they're going to so, sell it back to us, right? They're going to sell it back to you. That's right. And, you know, as, um, uh, you know, the, the price gets to the point to where it's, uh, uh, you know, feasible, uh, then... You know, it's harvested, even uh, fly ash that wouldn't have been considered usable 20 years ago is now because it all comes down to can somebody make money? They're actually able to reprocess it and clean it up, for lack of better terms, and utilize it in concrete. There's This is not just trying to get rid of something. These, these uh, attributes from... So let's say slag cement or fly ash are beneficial to yeah. the end product of concrete. Yeah. Fly ash, slag cement, smaller particle size. So when you talk about durability, 
you've got a denser concrete when you're properly mixing these materials into into the concrete. Or yep. if you've got these, um, let's say a wind tower, that it, it's a big foundation underneath that um, uh, the tower. Well, heat of hydration is, is something that really needs to be monitored. So with that situation, you want to really increase the amount of, let's say, slag cement or fly ash that's in the mix. It will take longer for it to get full strength. There are additives that uh, can be added to, to make that set time a little faster, but you want to lower that heat of hydration and those properties of slag cement, fly ash are really beneficial. Um, yeah. You know, when you've got situations where um, you've got uh, uh, sulfate attack, you've got uh, poor soils, utilizing a uh, class F fly ash or a slag cement in the concrete will help protect you from, you know, uh, those, those uh, detrimental. Um, yeah, those kind of chemical attacks. Yeah. And we've got, you know, the industry's got a, a fairly long history with those cementitious materials like slag and fly ash. Um, you know, hundreds, thousands of projects, uh, or, you know, tens of thousands of projects all over the world uh, have used those products to replace a portion of the cement in the concrete. We, we, the properties are very well known, very well documented, but let's go back to the Portland limestone cement where I'm now changing the properties of the cement itself by taking out some of that clinker and just putting in some more limestone and grinding and blending it all together. Yeah. Um, it it, it just, seems like... It, go and ahead. Just before we do that, you, when you mentioned the experience with slag and fly ash, my family's mm -hmm. ready mix business was using fly ash back in the mid 70s. Yeah, yeah. In the ready mix operation, so... yeah. Yeah, so so plenty of history. But now that we're doing this with the, so to me, I look at this Portland limestone cement, right? And it's, I look at it and say, well, gee, that's a, it seems really easy. Like like you know that that I'm just going to take out some of the clinker and I'm going to put in some limestone and and I'm going to grind it all together and I'm still going to get cement that produces the same properties. So my questions are like, number one, does it? have this is the concrete that results from using that cement does it have the same properties and how much history is out there because i know that that while this seems to be fairly new in the us um i've done some research and seen that other parts of the world have used what we're calling portland limestone cement um for for a little bit longer than than maybe we have here is that right it is um, actually Germany back in 1965 was using a uh, blended hydraulic cement with okay. uh, uh, limestone up to 15%, I believe. Uh, Canada has been using it since 2008. 80% of the okay. concrete in Canada is produced with Portland limestone cement. How how much? 80%? 80%. Okay. All right. Interesting. And, um, uh, so the, the United States back as early as 2004, I believe, had had uh, ASTM C595 as an available blended hydraulic cement up to 5%. It's just nobody really was using it okay. because they were using slag cement or fly ash. And, but with the, uh, you know, the new uh, uh, sustainability initiatives, with trying to reach PCA's goal of, of uh, being carbon neutral by 2050, this was yeah. the time to utilize what's been being used in Europe, and Canada for decades. And okay. so uh, the cement, and, and, and I've worked for the Portland Cement Association for seven and a half years. I've never seen anything move as fast as what this has. And, you know, I do specification reviews for, you know, very large engineering firms and some national, international corporations and things. And this is catching a lot of people by surprise. Our, our industry isn't real quick to change. And so there's a lot of specifications out there that just call for 
uh, Portland Cement meeting ASTMC 150. Yeah. And they do allow for slag cement. They allow for fly ash, but they do not have anything in there that says ASTM C595, blended hydraulic yeah. cement. Yeah. And so what I'm doing, and, and quite frankly, I'm here at the American Concrete Institute, and a lot of people are not familiar with how fast this is going. Yeah. Um, in the state of Michigan, for example, there are three cement manufacturers that ship into that state. By the end of the second quarter, all three of those will be shipping a Portland limestone cement, type 1L cement, meeting ASTM C595. You will not be able to get a type 1 cement, C150 yeah. cement in Michigan any longer. Yeah, and you you mentioned that to me, and, and, and you and I have talked, and I've talked with uh, – uh, some other industry people and, and seen some posts about how fast this is catching on, which like you said, is, is really unusual because quite frankly, we don't, we, we don't really adopt any change real fast in the construction industry um, and uh, you know, concrete included. So the, the, to me, the speed at which this is gaining, uh, I don't know, acceptance and popularity is, is really incredible. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, hats off to our industry for for recognizing that it's such a big and easy jump in reducing our carbon footprint that we're going to do it right now. So that's you know that's awesome. Um, well, the other and, thing, the, the other thing is it's it's been researched. It's yeah. got uh, decades of performance history. So mm -hmm. it's not like we're, we're switching to something and we're going to be scared of what's going to happen. And that's yeah. there's none of that. And, okay, you know. And what I hear from, you know, different firms are, oh, well, we don't know about this yet. Well, look at Europe. Look at Canada. Right. It's been used. Yep. And quite yep. frankly, these are international uh, Fortune 100 cement manufacturers. They're not going to put themselves into any type of a trick box that's going to come right. back to haunt them. This is proven technology that, that works you just need to make sure that your specifications are keeping up with the times because things are changing fast. Well, okay. And so let's, let's do two things. Let's look at Paul's question here. What's the difference in strength development between Portland limestone cement and then just our regular Portland cement? What's the reactivity difference? Um, it's my understanding that, that, that strength development is, is, the same. I mean, I, there might be a measurable difference, but it's not, it's, it's, it's relatively insignificant. Is that correct? It, it's very comparable. Every, uh, and it's no different than, uh, uh, you know, any of the previous cements, uh, one cement manufacturer based upon the amount of gypsum that they maybe would right. blend into their mix. You know, every cement manufacturer has its little different intricacies. You're going to mm -hmm. find the same thing with type 1L cement. Yeah. However, uh, as for any concerns about where the uh, the strength comparison's at, there isn't any. I mean, okay. they're going to be comparable. Uh, same way with set time. Um, yep. You know, there might be variabilities from one cement manufacturer to the other. But uh, all in all, this pretty much tracks the same, the same uh, range that you would find with a Portland type 1 cement. Type one, two. Okay. Okay. And, and that I, I think we've already answered Craig's question. I wanted to throw it up here though. Is there any advantage disadvantages in a cold application like here in Canada? So I guess if 80% of the cement that they're using in Canada is already Portland limestone cement, probably they've got it figured out that there's no, uh, no disadvantages. I, I actually uh, read, I think on, on PCA site, what was, what was PCA's website, by the way, that uh, where they really talk about this, uh, this this PLC product is it uh, greener? It's uh, greenercement.com. G r e e n e r cement c e m e n t dot com. Okay, great. And I'll put that in the comments, like at the end of the the broadcast mm -hmm. here, so you, you all can find that. But you know, I noticed a couple of things in there. One was that the uh, uh, it's 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 a it's a very small percentage, but or a very small gain or increase 
But there's actually some studies that show that the this might actually improve the durability of uh, of the concrete a little bit over just uh, regular Portland cement, mm-hmm. and uh, and I think that probably depends on the the blend and the and the manufacturer as well. Well, well um, some of it is because of the uh, the, the finer grind of just the, the finer grinds, okay, the, the, of the uh, limestone that is being blended in with the clinker might give you a little uh, a greater durability, similar to what you would find with smaller particle size from fly ash or slag cement. It's just, it, you know, when you're putting it all together, you're filling in all those voids with a little smaller particle size. Yeah, um, I've seen some studies that show you might get a little higher earlier strength um, uh, with a uh, Portland limestone cement, but uh, you know, the one thing I'm just telling people is it's not going to be a big difference here, yeah. but the benefit is you've just lowered your carbon footprint and it's measurable by anywhere from 10 to 15 percent in your concrete when you're yeah, using which is, That's huge. Yeah, I, I think that's amazing. And, and the so um, Benham had a, a question or comment here. Uh, you know, talking about how important sustainability and construction is and, you know, shouldn't we be looking at adopting these things on a global scale and not just in one country or regionally? And so that, I think, Mike, gets to your comments about the specifications. So the other thing that I think is really interesting about Portland limestone cement is we didn't develop, the industry didn't develop PLC and then go out and say, oh man, we need a a standard to write that allows us to use this. The standard was already, there's already an ASTM standard. There's a Canadian standard. There's there's an AASHTO standard. There's a European standard um, that is blended, basically blended hydraulic cement. So the, the cement manufacturers really just sort of started manufacturing a product that meets those standards for blended hydraulic cement, those standards that have been in place for many, many years. Um, now there's, but, but, you know, the difference is now they're kind of saying, um, Hey, we're going to, we're really going to start moving towards this as the standard rather than uh, just regular old Portland cement, because, it's easy for us to produce and it, 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 we have an immediate hit on our, uh, on our carbon emissions. We have an immediate well, reduction on our carbon mi- emissions. It, yeah. And I, and I like to add that, uh, these, uh, uh, cement manufacturers are for-profit businesses and quite frankly, they've had to put hundreds of millions of dollars into refurbishing these plants by companies and, you know, they're like anything else. They're not going to do it until they feel the timing's right. Then it justifies it. And yeah, the yeah. timing's right now. Well, good point. And, uh, and by the way, thank you, Luke, for for throwing up that greenercement.com uh, website there. It's in the chat now for everybody, and I've got it up on the screen. Um, again, just just greenercement.com. And uh, and there's there's really a lot of great information on there. There's you know if you want to really get down into the weeds, which which we decided we weren't going to do here, but there's lots of graphs that will really help you you know zero in on strength gain. I saw you know I saw one graph there that looked at uh, shrinkage and showed that actually shrinkage is a little probably is a little less with uh, with Portland limestone cement. Uh, with concrete made from Portland limestone cement. So there's, you know, if you if you really want some detailed information, that greenercement.com is a good place to uh, to go. But I don't I don't want to overlook what what Mike has said a couple of times here, which is that as an industry, um, we need to be ready to allow our projects to utilize this material. So if you're an architect, an engineer, a spec writer, a concrete contractor, um, and and your specifications that you put out are calling for concrete made with Portland cement meeting the requirements of ASTM C one fifty. You're you're sort of uh, you're you're out you're, of spec. <laughs> yeah, you you can't use this, or you're going to be out of spec. You yeah. need to add that. And and Mike, give me the the, the ASTM standard again. It's a ASTM C five ninety five five nine five. 
for blended hydraulic cements. Okay. And this is considered type 1L. Okay. Cement. Um, so again, it's it's not a new standard. It's bl the, the that, that standard has been out there for a long time. Yep. Um, this is just a different type of cement that meets that standard instead of the, the C-150 standard. Um, but it's really important that your projects allow that type of cement for you to take advantage of this, um, which is, which is, I think needs to be a key takeaway for everybody today. Number one. And number two, in areas like, uh, Michigan, you mentioned, Mike, um, you, your, your project specifications better allow the use of this because that's about all the manufacturers are going to sell you in that area anymore. Yeah. Um, so, we need, you know, I do think it's important that we make sure that these things are, are aligned. Um, and I wanted to put up, Mike, you sent this to me. Um, and and then this map shows, and you'll see it's because it's not blown up. Some of these areas, for example, uh, uh, down in Texas has multiple plants where yeah. we'll see, uh, it, you know, the, the pin drop is a little darker. Um, these plants are scattered throughout the United States and Canada, but uh, here this graphic show in the United States. So uh, there's one company that I just received an email from that, um, what did they say? They service, uh, uh, they put in here the number of customers that they service. Uh, they, they do 10 million metric tons a year. They have 36 cement terminals across the country and they distribute to over 20 states. And by the end of 2022, they will no longer produce anything but type 1L cement. Interesting. Okay. So, uh, you, you know, you 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 said this earlier and, and we talked about it for a bit, but I just think it's incredible to see our industry adopt something this quickly. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so I, I really do think it, it goes to the, the quality of the product. It goes to the fact that, that, you know, the cement producers realize that, that they could start producing this product and that it met a specification that already exists because that's always, that's always a long road is, oh, I've got this new product, but it doesn't meet any standards. So now I need to get industry to go out and develop a, a new standard. We're not doing a, that here. That's yeah, a 10 year plus project. To develop. At, at least. Yeah. Yeah. You and I have, have seen that, that play out in different things and, and it's a, it's a long road. So that's not what's happening here. These standards are already out there and I'll, I'll point out, I'm going to, I'm going to put this up from, uh, from Luke again, this greener cement.com um, on that website. One of the things that I noticed there is uh, they do a good job of walking you through which cement standard you need to call out depending on which country you're in. Um, so they, they, you know, they call out the European standard, they call out the Canadian standard. Um, they, there, there's a different standard if you're in airport construction doing runways. Um, and, and they do a good job on that greener cement.com of, uh, of pulling out the, uh, the different standards for Portland limestone or that you can call out in, in order to be able to use Portland limestone cement. So right. I think that's, uh, that's important. The, the one comment that a lot of people come up with, well, it's going to take forever for State Department of Transportations to approve this. I'd, I'd like to point out that yep. all but three of the 50 states have already approved it. Yeah. And in, including recently uh, Caltrans, which is, is you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Arizona, but I'm, I'm like California adjacent. And so we, we always watch what California is doing. Caltrans is, you know, has some some very uh, stringent approval processes and, and quite frankly, some some pretty uh, advanced uh, labs and testing and research that they do on on concrete and other building materials. And um, and and that was the big announcement a few months ago is, is that Caltrans has now approved the use of, of Portland limestone cement. So, um, yeah, that's you know, that's that's huge as well. Um, I want to, I want to keep talking. I, I do want to say we're, we're, uh, we're coming down about like eight or nine minutes left. And, um, there's it, for those of you that haven't been on one of these LinkedIn lives, there's a bit of a, uh, lag between 
us talking and you seeing and you posting comments and us seeing comments. So if anybody has any questions before we let Mike get away, go ahead and drop those into the chat now. We do see those questions. And uh, like you say, we can uh, we can try and pick through those and 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 select some to uh, to answer or address. Um, there may be a few on here as we go through the feed that we just don't see. And so if I skipped your question, um, don't worry, we'll we'll go back and look and see what we can answer and we'll we'll post about those or uh, put some some links to some answers here in the chat. Um, and feel just free to, to feel out. free to uh, message me on LinkedIn, you know, follow me, whatever, because I am on LinkedIn. I do, you know, my share postings and and religiously follow it. So yeah, yeah, Mike. Mike actually is is very easy to to get a hold of on on messaging on on LinkedIn, which is uh, which is nice because I obviously spend a bunch of my time on LinkedIn, so it's nice and easy for me to pop over to LinkedIn messaging and 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 send him a note real quick. Um, Mike, what what else what else is important to know before we kind of wrap this up? Is there anything we missed? What else is important to know about Portland limestone cement? I think the you know the one big takeaway that we've got is um, go back right now and make sure that your project specifications allow the use uh, yeah. of this product. Um, the other big takeaway is there's there's really no significant change in finished properties. Um, what else? Is there anything else that we uh, that we missed? Uh, you know, this uh, uh, industry is really slow to change. And just be aware that there are some out there um, that that um, you just want to be careful because th this is not something to be scared of. This is not something to not allow on your projects or that you have to pay a consultant tens of thousands of dollars to do more research on to verify that it's OK to use. Um, that's not... This is something that's moving forward. This is something that's good for the environment. It's good for the industry. And this isn't going to uh, hurt the industry because of, of failures. So yeah. you know, that, yeah. that's what I just want to get across because, quite frankly, I'm hearing all good sorts point. of things. And uh, um, we're just, this industry is really slow to change. And this one's happening faster than a lot of people have a comfort level for, and yeah. um, it doesn't need to be that way. This is not yeah. something that was just pulled out of the sky. As Jim said, ASTM C595 has been around a long time. It's just now we're starting to utilize it. Now, now we're starting to utilize it. That's I, that, that's probably the best way to put this is that, that we didn't go out. Nobody went out and created a new standard so that we could make a more sustainable product. The standard has been there. C595 mm -hmm. or blended hydraulic cement has been around for many, many, many years. Yeah. Now we're just starting to utilize it. That's it. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and I think this, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, this is, this is important. And, uh, and, and like you said, Mike, our industry tends to resist change a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and I and I think your message is an important one because I know you know way back when when we started replacing a portion of cement with fly ash when we made concrete, mm -hmm. um, you know we saw we saw resistance for for a lot of years to uh, to that. There are still um, people. There are still and there people. are still people <laughs> who believe that we're just getting rid of a waste product when in fact. We are getting rid of a waste product, but we're actually producing better concrete. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, and and so I think that that your message is important, Mike. That that you know, this is we we're just now making a new type of cement that meets a standard that's been around for a long time, um, and it's a good thing from a sustainability standpoint. It's also a good thing um, from the from the standpoint of of producing a better material. Um, so yeah, don't really, I, I think you're right to really encourage the industry. Um, don't be afraid of this product. Don't feel like you need to go out and do a bunch of testing. Uh, don't feel like you need to go hire an expert, uh, just because you're switching from Portland cement to Portland limestone cement. I just don't think you need to do any of those things. I think you just right. need to 
to to say, hey, on this project, in addition to to using Portland cement that meets ASTM C150, you can you can now use uh, Portland limestone cement that meets uh, ASTM C595. It's yeah. it's really as simple as that, right? That's it. it it's really that simple. All right. And I, I, like I have the language. I probably have sent out 50 emails in the last uh, uh, three weeks to different engineering and architectural firms and national manufacturers to update their specs. Okay. Yeah, I, that's that's important. And, and again, um, I hope the takeaway from for everybody here is go check your project specifications and uh, get them updated to include to include these standards. Um, Lynn had asked, is this being recorded? Will it be available for those that might not have been able to attend? Yes, absolutely. Um, you just return to this event page and this this whole broadcast will stream anytime. Um, if you know somebody that would benefit from from watching this or listening to this, just share this event page with them and, and they can watch this anytime. Um, be happy to, to have you do that. So that would be great. And, and Jim, um, just I, I wanted to add, Euclid Chemical yeah. is a licensed um, uh, master spec manufacturer. So okay. I actually do have the master spec language okay. for uh, including ASTM C595 blended hydraulic cements into your contract documents. Okay, so, so that's something if, 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 we have, if we have architects or specifiers, um, that's something that they could, could contact you and, and, get yes. that, uh, and get that language. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. I think that's important. Um, well, we are right about at time, Mike. I, I really appreciate you joining me today. Um, I think we got a lot of great information. I really hope people go out and share this event page because I think that for our industry, there's a lot of good information here um, on, on switching from a product that we've used for many, many decades to a product now that's just a little bit different, but all of a sudden has a, a real significant reduction in its carbon footprint while still giving us the same great concrete and, and masonry and cement based products that we've always, uh, you know, that we've always used. So I think it's, it's a great message and I hope it gets shared. Um, again, Mike, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me. Um, full name is Michael Weber. So if you're looking for him on LinkedIn, uh, just search for Michael Weber with Euclid chemical with and, one B uh, with one B. With yes, one with B. one B, W E B E R, Michael <laughs> Weber with one B, uh, with Euclid Chemical, um, and uh, and you can follow him. And uh, like he mentioned, he's got that master spec language for you architects and, and specifiers out there. Um, so he he is a great person to contact. You can of course also uh, follow me uh, on on LinkedIn. Um, you can subscribe to my newsletter and I will definitely put some highlights and some links from this into my newsletter. So if you've missed anything and don't want to rewatch the whole broadcast, go subscribe to my newsletter on LinkedIn and I will put some highlights and links in there for you. Um, again, thanks for everybody. Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, Mike, have a great uh, rest of the convention out there mm -hmm. at ACI and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you again later. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for joining.